Welcome, folks. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to Moad's Art As We See It, um, where we get together and talk about art and music and really whatever comes to um, comes to mind. We're happy that you could join us today, and we invite you to join our conversation via chat. My name is Sade, and I'm here with my colleagues, my beloved educators um, and colleagues and educator do docents. Uh, Dimitri, Charlie, Remy, Lucarissa, and Rodney. We're waiting for Remy. She'll get here at, at some point. And then uh, we invite you to contribute to our discussion as we look at art with curiosity and wonder. If you're joining us on Facebook, put your thoughts in the chat and we'll jump in and out of Zoom to check on you. And we, before we move on, also let us know where you're joining us from uh, in the chat. We, we love to know. Um, where you're joining us from. Okay, before we start, let's take a, a, a moment um, as we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Also, as settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous people of, um, whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands and thank the indigenous people uh, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I'm so excited about today. Um, today's topic has been, we've been thinking about and discussing, um, presenting the music and art of the Harlem Renaissance. And the images are sourced, all of the images are sourced from Smithsonian American art, aside from one. And we'll, we'll look at that. And the music and art pairing was were uh, curated, curated by Charlie. Hey, Charlie. And Charlie, you want to tell us a little bit about what we're about to enjoy? Sure. Uh, what we're going to be looking at and listening to are artists that are associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Um, okay. Harlem Renaissance during the, you know, during the 20s and 30s, I mean, that, that was the place to be, you know, if you were a musician, an artist, a writer, there was just so much going on. There was such a cultural explosion um, that was going on. Um, and you know, you'll recognize a lot of the names that we're going to talk about. One of the things I do want to warn people about is that we're going to be talking about people and looking at their art and listening to their music. But the stuff that we're looking at is not necessarily from that period. And that's because we're sort of, uh, you know, we're a little bit tied with what we can use in terms of copyright. So for example, we'll be looking at, at a piece of art that's from 1970, for example, clearly not the period of the, the Harlem Renaissance, but um, it will involve someone who was a major player in the Harlem Renaissance. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I, I appreciate that introduction also. And, and um, some of the music and the art that in this piece, I just, I, we can spend a whole day, but we'll get, go ahead and, and get started with uh, Van der Zee. So um, a photographer, a capturing power of our Renaissance. Um, you know, it, I, it's interesting to me how a person becomes an artist. That background story is very, it's very interesting to me is that, you know, Van der Zee won a, a camera, a, kind of a, a small camera at a fair. And that's how his career kind of started and sort of, um, sort of took off, of course. Um, he, he took photographs of celebrities and just everyday lives, you know, churchgoers and um, children and people just living their lives. He, and he celebrated, I think that word is very important, celebrated uh, people of the Harlem, um, people of Harlem um, at that time. And this photo, um, as, as Charlie, I am so, excited about your pair, um, your music pairing. So let's listen to it and let's look at this photo. He was a lonesome girl when 
that some gal don't love you. I'm so disgusted, heartbroken too. I've got the downhearted blues. Once I was crazy about that gal. She mistreated me all the time. The next gal I get, she's got the promise to be mine. All Yeah, hey, awesome. we got Remy here. Hey, Remy. <laughs> Finally joining us. Yay. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, Vanderzee is such an important player during the Harlem Renaissance. First of all, he had a really uh, substantial uh, business running a private uh, photography studio so that, you know, if you were middle class and above, you could go to his studio and get a photograph of your family. And, you know, we've talked about this idea that having a portrait back in the days of painting cost a lot of money. But now with photography, it democratized the idea of having a portrait. And so he had a really substantial business doing that. But he was also a guy who just had his camera in his hand all the time and if there was some event going on in Harlem he took pictures of it if there was a parade if there was a demonstration if there was a concert he was there with his camera um I'm going to talk just very briefly about the music that we listen to uh, it's really interesting when I first heard uh that piece it's by UB Blake and Noble Sissel Noble Sissel is the one who's singing it, and I actually thought it was a woman that was singing it at first uh, but it's not. The two of them, U.B. Blake and uh, Noble Sissel, became uh, what was known as the Dixie Duo. And they would do sort of a vaudeville uh, piano act. And, you know, they, they had a lot of success. Um, they wrote the song, I don't know how many of you know that song, I'm just wild about Harry, Harry's wild about me, right? And that was for a Broadway show called Shuffle Along, which premiered in 1921. And it was a really important show because it was the first time that it was an all black show. Um, and so it, it had all these famous people in it. It had a young Josephine Baker, who was one of the performers. And, uh, you know, we'll see other people that were involved within this show. It was a really important musical. So they're, they're, they're important players. And in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, later on, Noble Sissy had a band where he had Lena Horne in the band. So they were, they were major players, UB Blake and, and Noble Sissy, Sissel. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and let uh, you talk about the, the photograph a little bit. Um, I just uh, want to read a comment from chat that uh, Doreen says that when, she, when we were cleaning out my family home in Terrytown, New York, we found several photos taken by James Van Der Zee. So, so that, that's a really special connection that you have. Um, my, own, my own reaction, I, I find this um, photograph, I love the expression on her face. You know, it's, um, she's not smiling. She's just kind of looking at us. She's making direct eye contact. And then the other thing that really strikes me about this photograph is that um, the little seated um, porcelain figure next to her, yeah. <laughs> kind of the, the pairing of the two of them, I find very interesting. I didn't, and, and, and yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Sydney. I'm going to say, you know, the, the evening attire, uh, just the title itself, it kind of lends me to think, you know, just somebody who's going out or who has gone out and at a party. And so it's, it, it's, it kind of, it's not just in a studio, it just kind of captures um, the energy of what might be happening. Yeah. Yeah, and you see that little porcelain figure in other photos of it, you know, it becomes a prop in the studio. And he has a self-portrait where you see that that same prop right next to him. So it's a it's a lovely photo. I I think it's it's first of all quality wise it's great, but it's also just uh it, it's just I don't know it's of a particular time and place, and so I really like it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. in that period before there's a lot of sharpness in in portrait photographs. Um, so we see it's kind of dreamy in in, in its mood. I think. Yeah. I think the other thing um, Sherry is saying is she's gorgeous, self-confident and regal. And I, I just wanted to just quickly add to that in terms of, you know, um, a little bit of detail about the attire that she's wearing, which, you know, our own adornment always adds to our self um, exp expression and upliftment. And, uh, you know, she is wearing the fox 
um, stole. Um, I think it's probably the whole fox. It's probably got his head on it somewhere as well. Um, and, and I think when you look really closely, it's hard to see um, quite how detailed the dress is. It's beaded. And, um, you, you know, during this time, a beaded dress, like we think nothing of a beaded dress anymore because it's off the rack and at Ross. But um, <laughs> but here, you know, this beaded dress is is probably handmade for her, and the beads are, um, are probably hand sewn on as well. So not only the person wearing the dress is somebody who is middle class and showing off what she aspires to and what she maintains to be in her life and pertains to be in her life. Somebody who looks like she goes out in the evening, wears a hat, possibly to the theater, possibly to movies, the moving pictures um, of that time. It was a little bit early for the moving pictures, but you know, some kind of form of evening entertainment with the attire and the, like the shoes, the stockings, the dress, the stole. And it, to me, it's interesting is the dress has short sleeves, but she's wearing a stole, which is, you know, like the stole is obviously part of an accessory as opposed to something that's supposed to necessarily keep you warm, although mm. it's supposed to add both. But also a proper dress lady would not go out without a hat on as mm. well. And, and so, uh, you know, there is all of that. And then, you know, the whole effort that Van der Zien himself in his studio has created this framework in which for people to come and stand in front of, you yeah. know, so he's created this narrative, even though he's a photographer and it's a beautiful photograph, but the, the background is, is more like a portrait painter would think about the background. And he has really thought about what's in the background for the subject to, to be photographed against. You see the full floor, you see, you know, a window, whether that's real or, or not, we don't know because it's a it's a studio and then the portrait as well so obviously he's also has um put in a lot of effort to create the whole experience not only for us looking at the photograph all these years later but for the the person having their portrait taken because that would have been a really important day in your life it wouldn't be just like you know one of those passport booths where you go in and pay ten dollars and a holler and then you're out the other side no this is a whole thing where you get dressed and you are you know quite fabulous I think yeah oh, it's beautiful or um our, our next our next piece is this one and yeah this is yeah, I know right right it's it's you and me are gonna we're going to tear this up today. <laughs> <laughs> After we've actually found the original and stolen it and ran off That's with it. Right. That's right. Well, let's see what the, the music Charlie picked for this one. So that's Jolly Roll Morton, um, who of course is a is a giant from from that period, and uh, he, his original his his real last name was Lamoth, um, mm -hmm. but he had to change it so that his uh, his his family would not finding out would not be finding out that he was playing in a brothel, and once his grandmother found out that he was playing in a brothel, she basically disowned him and, and kicked him out of the house. But you know, he, he was a very, very talented musician and very influential to a lot of other people. But he was also kind of a, you know, he was a difficult guy. He was kind of arrogant. Um, he was known to have a, and this is a great quote, a bumptious personality. And it ended up that he alienated so many of his friends that, that only a few of them 
uh, ended up showing up at his funeral, but his, his influence was inescapable. He was recorded by Alan Lomax, a person that we talked about several times in the show, who was so important in terms of uh, preserving uh, musical trends that were, you know, that would have been disappeared without, without recordings. But it's also interesting because he came up with a style of playing the piano that was kind of, kind of all of its own. And, you know, what he said was, uh, he said he kind of came up with this style because all the other piano players were playing so fast, so much faster than, than he could, that he kind of created his own style so that it wouldn't show his lack of speed. And, and you know, that, that sort of, you know, using that slower tempo allowed him to use more flares. And even some of it has, you know, what he considered a, a little bit of Spanish influence to the sound of it. So uh, that, that's Jelly Roll Morton. Oh, wow. Well, that, that was, what does, uh, what does the word mean, Bum, bumptious? Bumptious. I mean, it's kind Dimitri of, it's was kind of, asking. You no, know, <laughs> it, it it is what it sounds like. You know, you just you know, a bunch of personality. I don't know if it's really a real word, but it just you know, it's a it's a real word. What is what it was. You know, I think I think Rodney has put the the actual dictionary sure definition. <laughs> it's not a word. It's not a word anyone really uses these days. It probably doesn't get said on Zoom very much. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Hope assertive. Well, that sounds great. And J Jacob Lawrence, I mean, in this in this one is it's such a special, in, intimate story about this painting. Um, is that this shows also a, a dedication, a respect to how he learned and how by going to the library, by frequenting a, a specific library, this could be that, that this is 135th um, Street Library in New York, which is the Schomburg Center currently, and, and how he frequented libraries and how that in, enriched his, his education, his learning. He might actually be, um, I, I think I'm, I'm assuming that he might actually be painting himself in different characters in this one. Um, that's what it looks like to me. And uh, the other thing I wanna point out is the, the blue. If you follow the blue, um, it, the blue kind of frames the, the picture and, and then secondary, in the secondary, as a secondary color, if you follow the green, the green kind of frames itself. It makes you look all over the painting. And, I, and that is definitely not accidental, knowing Jacob Lawrence's expertise in, in, uh, in working with color. And so, yeah, and Remy, please. Oh, I, I, I just, <laughs> you know what I said at the meeting I, when we were looking at this, the, f the first, I'm going to just repeat it. When, we, when I was looking at this the first time, you know, I feel the library, you know, that's one of the things I feel like he's portrayed really well is like that, you know, the different characters that you see in any given library anywhere, you know, we've got the, the person here with, I think, with the white hair carrying the books, I think is Frederick Douglass <laughs> in the library with his books, um, if I was to add a story. But then you've got other people looking, pouring over these texts. And I think before our libraries were on um, Google, you know, when you went into a real library, you would see the people, studious people studying anything from like this character on the left on my left with what looks like he's looking at art and pictures mm -hmm. and and I think there's there's a sister at the front of the um of this picture and she's wearing her her beads or her pearls to the library so there's you know again this uh upwardly mobile astute studious community of people um, black people, just let's make sure we mention that as well. In the library, you know, um, despite what people say that we don't read, but here's the evidence. I rest my case. Let's move on. <laughs> For me, I have a special connection because my mother was a librarian. So I've always seen libraries oh. as special places uh, in, in very important public spaces where it brings together people from different backgrounds. And I think that that's what he's really showing us here is, uh, you know, the, like we've got the woman with her beads, but maybe we have other people who 
are of lesser means, but, but this is a place where we all become equal. We're all trying to gain knowledge. And it's, it's, you know, this library, I think it's patterned or it's based on the one in New York on 135th street. Uh, you know, it, it's like a very important place in the middle of a community. Uh, and especially for an artist, you know, we see people looking at um, art books in this. So just, um, wonderful you know i've loved jacob lawrence's work and i always love seeing what he does with color um, and it's wonderful that he applies that to the scene in a library yeah and just this is an example of what i was talking about earlier so here you know this piece is from 1960 so mm. past the harlem renaissance but he was such an important figure in the harlem renaissance and and you know we couldn't find a lot of uh, work that was in the public domain. So that's, you know, again, I'm, I'm playing a little fast and loose with that, but please cut me some slack because it was difficult to find pieces it, uniquely from that era that we could use online, so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, shout out to San Francisco Public Library. I just have to do that. Um, shout out to San Francisco Public Library, which also has African-American um, center with at, at the main library. So I just, Want to put that out there libraries are very very important um, and the fact that you know this place now is named after schomburg and it, it has the largest collection of um you know that black centered research and literature um to you know i i just saw i just want to celebrate libraries and specifically the schomburg center which is if you haven't checked out their online resources do so and then next Oh, a couple of com comments yes. in chat. Yeah, um, Pamela yeah. says the library is a very important focus locus in the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. And yes, I totally agree that this shows W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, oh, I want to e the, read that book so badly. <laughs> and uh, Lauren says, thank you for choosing this piece. I'm in love with it and hadn't seen it before. Uh, Lauren, me too. I hadn't seen it before. That's one of the reasons it's so great being part of uh, this group. And I think if you know Jacob Lawrence's migration series, for example, mm -hmm. this really is different. You know, he's using a different palette and a little bit more complexity in the palette than he was with that. So it's an interesting piece. I, I love it too. I think it's a, it's a really wonderful work. All right, Charlie, the, your next piece, the next piece that you chose is this one by, by Jacob Lawrence. And Let's listen to the music and listen to Dimitri and Kurisa tell us a little bit. Romance and bandana days and those quaint old bandana ways. When granddads courted our grandmothers, they would show some bashful brothers and in all their bandana plays. Let's cut, keep cut, bandana craze and they would care. So that's a, that's Yubi Blake again. Um, just you know, it's really active music, and it, you know this this particular song here is a little bit more of sort of a pop song, uh, but some of the stuff you're going to see is really bridging a gap between blues and ragtime, and then into jazz. At the, uh, you know, a, as it sort of develops further. Um, but he's a really interesting guy. And, and I, I do need to make a reference to a piece that we looked at a couple of, uh, I guess, months ago when we did uh, something on Father's Day. We, we showed a person who was sitting at the beach holding his child. And we talked about how he had been a war hero because he, he was in this division in World War I called the Hellcats because Blacks were not allowed to fight alongside Whites in World War I. So they had to fight for French government troops. And so that guy that we saw that picture of had been decorated in the Hellcats, which was a highly, highly decorated um, company in, in the army. Well, UB Blake and no Noble Sissel played music. They, they were part of the Hellcats and they, they were the, you know, they were the, the army entertainment for the Hellcats. So I think it's a really nice connection to a prior piece that we saw as well. I'll let you talk about the art. Yeah. Lucarisa and Dimitri. Oh, 
okay. Um, I sorry, I thought Dimitri was gonna take it first, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I really like this place, you know, I'm, I'm a color girl. And so I just love, you know, all of these really bold um, colors. Um, this was actually a, a study for a mural um, that was done in Jamaica, New York. And um, Lawrence was uh, one of the eight, was one of eight artists that was commissioned to create works on the theme of community. And this was great for him because he always acknowledged, you know, how he valued um, the black community and how he was encouraged by the black community. And he would uh, frequently walk through the streets of Jamaica, um, New York, and just look at the, the warmth and the, the rapport of people, the movements of people as they were, you know, going on their way, going to work, going to the clubs, going to school. And he also would notice notice the geometric and um, organic structures of the doors and um, he would look at people's apparel, he'd look at their facial expressions. He just he just took everything in, he, everything that was stimulating and unique about the environment he was in, he just took it all in and put it in his, in his art. Um, he uh, would, would take scenes from the Harlem life and just take all of those bold colors and, and just, I, I love it that he would just use all of this. And, and what was, I found also interesting was that, you know, he didn't necessarily use um, all of like the expensive products to create his art. I mean, sometimes he would use poster paints, he would use brown paper bags, <laughs> just whatever he had at hand to create his art, which I always think is fascinating, you know, that when people can just take what they have at hand and, and make mm. wonderful pieces of art. Um, it, he would um, also, his painting method, you know, the panel knows I'm just really into figuring out how people do things. And so I just thought it was really interesting that he would use a series format to, to convey his, his content. And what that means is that he would literally take like storyboards and create a story about his art, he would actually take, I mean, we're talking 50, 60 boards and he would draw things out on these boards. And then when he would take the color, number one, he didn't like to use, uh, he didn't like to mix his colors because as he was going along the board, he would, he would put dots of paint on each storyboard. And so he didn't mix the paints because he wanted to make sure all of the colors were the same on each storyboard, which I just thought, wow, that, that is really something. I mean, that's, that's really labor intensive. And he would, actually, he would actually sometimes write captions so he would remember what he was thinking about in that particular part of, of the, the art project. So that, I mean, I thought that was great. Um, what really attracted me to this also was that it reminded me personally of, of where I lived in San Francisco when I was a child. Um, we had just, uh, we had all kinds of different people in our neighborhood. We had Trinidadians, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, African-Americans, and all of us just had, you know, this sense of, of color. So I kind of know that feeling, you know, of people rushing about, you know, mm -hmm. rushing about to work, rushing about to the, to the grocery stores, to the markets. You have all of that movement going on and then you have all the colors of you know the houses and the doors and so I just got that that sense of that when I looked at this I just I love it oh. yeah and I would I, I'm really glad that Charlie chose the study for this piece because if you look at the if you actually look at the finished um, mural it was uh, created for the Joseph Adabo Federal Building um, in Jamaica New York um, this this study has just so much life and movement and texture, and I love the fact, like Lucuriza says, I mean, he's using gouache in here, but it's probably on just like brown paper that he liked to use, and it's just really quick um, where he's where he's filling um, in the colors, and he calls it a dynamic cubism, and uh, I just I guess the only thing to add is um, that he says in terms of his colors. He was really inspired by the colors of Harlem. So Harlem was 
um, you know, very drab and gray, you know, it's, it's a concrete jungle. Um, and, to, and to bring life and energy, he says that people would, um, you know, also like uh, Luke Edis has said, this mishmash of different cultural influences would, would bring in color and life into their spaces. And so as he's walking along the streets and looking inside of people's windows and, you know, and seeing what they're wearing, th th these are the colors that, that he's seeing, these very tropical uh, colors that are in contrast to the grayness of Harlem. Um, yeah, I love this piece. Oh. Man. I just want, I just want to say, I loved Luke yeah, Reese's, uh, the background on, on his fidelity to color, you know, that that's really adds to my appreciation of this. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Um, we're going to move on to the next piece, which is color palette wise. Um, very interesting. So we'll see here. Uh, we're moving on to Aaron Douglas, which most of you know. And let's see the pairing. Really, I invite everyone to just take a deep breath and listen to this. It's so beautiful. On all my friends from the cotton fields away, gone from the earth. To a better land I know I hear those gentle voices calling to Joe. Um, this is Paul Robeson and boy, you know, when Paul Robeson did something, he didn't do it well, he did it extraordinarily well. Um, you know, he was a brilliant man. He was the valedictorian in his class at Rutgers University while he was playing football. Uh, and while he was playing football, he was chosen as an All-American. And uh, at least one source called him the greatest college and the, the football position, the you know, tight end uh, that college has ever had. Um, and then um, he got into Columbia Law School and went to Columbia Law School while he was playing in the NFL. So, I mean, you know, I, you know there was nothing that this guy couldn't do extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. And such an important player within the, the Harlem Renaissance because it wasn't just his, you know, his sports, his singing. He was also an actor and a political activist and, and got, actually got into a lot of trouble with the FBI. FBI because of his political activism. Um, you know, he was the first black man to play Othello uh, and, he, and he played across Uta Hagen. If you do crossword puzzles, you'll know the name Uta Hagen. Uh, you know, she was one of the great actresses of, of Europe um, and even tried to talk to Kennesaw, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the uh, commissioner of baseball to try to get uh, the commissioner to allow blacks into into baseball to, to integrate baseball at the time. Unfortunately, that wasn't successful. But you know, just a really important, uh, not only entertainer but thinker and political activist during the Harlem Renaissance. And I thought that this was a good pairing with Aaron Douglas, who I, I find who has very very serious themes in his his work. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and the, the creation is obviously what it says, but this is such an important piece also to think about when we think about, um, when we th think about the Genesis and um, Genesis in the Christian, um, Christian Bible. And specifically this one we know is um, about creation in Genesis because it's one of the three works that he did for um, James Waldron Johnson, who is the who is well known for the National Negro Anthem, um, uh, who had written that in so many other poems. And he worked on, um, he worked on paintings that reflect the poetry. And Aaron Douglas is also known to, to respond to the music and li the literature ar around him at that time as one of the people that opened the doors for um, 
or for a lot of African American artists, a lot of Black artists, and who had his unique mark on uh, modernism. Um, so we we see so many things with this painting. And look at the palette. Look at the work. Uh, look at the colors. Um, it's just it is just calming. Um, there's quietness about it. Um, there's, it's powerful, the hand kind of shown. If you read the poem, uh, you can kind of follow the painting from, from bottom up in the poem. And yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Yeah. Remy, you want to add any thoughts uh, on this one? <laughs> not anything that you haven't said, but I, 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 again, I'm always fascinated by this um, less is more type you know mm -hmm. it, it's it's something that actors get told a lot <laughs> less is more lovely um but but i i think it, as it pertains to the to the visual arts it's just like there's there's a lot there's a lot of shades but the color palette is very sparse but the actual mood and the emotion the somberness that he's able to create from from top to bottom with this i think is as spine tingling as as the song that mm. that, that um, Robeson is singing and for me anytime Paul Robeson sings anything it's a spine tingling moment you know like mm. he he's able to evoke that that visceral um, response in your body and I think for me this does as well it's very somber it's very sparse and the hand of God mm. reaching down or pulling up or you know whatever you, you want to project onto it so yeah and also just looking at the size of it it's it's um it's big but not huge at the the actual size of this particular piece of art yeah and also you know um a graphic designer you know he's a he's a graphic designer and he was so sought out in 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 the Harlem creative community to do book covers and all of those kind of things to design all these kind of things and so his relationship with these other creators is also what inform, informs his art and then at the same time also he is of the time um, with injecting that influence of the, the the Africanness the blackness into modern cubist kind of um, Cubist kind of thing that was of the, the time. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, and and uh, I was just yeah. going to say also the spiritual element that's always mm. and often present within the Black community and, and our work as well, not shying away from that by calling it creation. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I think that was my favorite piece, honestly. You do the same thing with his art where, like, for example, he puts Black faces in biblical scenes that Paul Robeson was doing on stage. You know, just, uh, you know, you're seeing a black man playing what was traditionally seen in a white face, you know? So it, it's, it's, it has its parallels there. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a whole pantheon of black actors who've played Othello, which is also interesting. Oh, I, I'm, okay. The piece after this one, is what I'm, I, when you're talking, right, I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait until Dimitri and Lucarissa talk about the next one. But I do, I do want to play the music for this piece, which is by Ramiro P. Virgin. Okay, ready? If you should miss the Charlie, tell us. Well, you know, this is Duke Ellington and, you know, I couldn't possibly do music about the Harlem Renaissance without having that particular song. I'm from New York. Anyone who's from New York knows that you take the A train to Harlem. So, you know, that that's just the perfect piece. And Duke Ellington was just, a, you know, a monster from this period. And he either wrote 
or a co-wrote more than a thousand compositions. So he's really, really prolific. Um, a lot of them that he wrote in, in particular this one uh, that we just heard with uh, Billy Strayhorn. And you know, he was just, uh, he, he's just such an interesting character. Um, he, he started taking piano lessons. And I, I, this almost sounds like a joke. He took piano lessons from a woman who was named Marietta Clink Scales, which is just, you know, what better name could you have as a, as a, <laughs> as a piano teacher. And you know, he started writing music uh, when he was very, very young. And there's a great story about him. You know, he, he worked as a soda jerk. And so he wrote his first piece called Soda Fountain Rag. And when he started playing out, one of the things he would do is he would play this same piece, this piece that he wrote, but he would write it as a one step, as a waltz, as a tango, as a foxtrot. So the people would think that he was playing all these different songs. All he was doing was just changing the rhythm and the style of the same song that he had written. But you know, oh, he, wow. you know he's you know just a fascinating character from the uh, Harlem Renaissance and just musically so important uh, in the world of jazz. And Charlie, is it is it right? Is it just like um, it says in the song that if you miss the A train, you're just pretty much screwed? You're whole, you got to take a cab or walk a long way. Depending on where you're okay. There's no any other line that, okay. Well, I suppose you could take one of the more central lines and then walk across, but you know, <laughs> that just oh, shows wow. you're not from New York. Well, you know, somebody's oh, asking, of, yeah. No, oh, sorry, sorry, so sorry you're right. is asking, what's the name of, oh, of the uh, artwork or the music? The music is called Take the A Train. I'll let you guys talk about the art piece. Yeah, and this, this, um, I love this piece. And, you know, I think, I, to tell you the truth, like, I, I, I wish the audience had a little time to just stare at this without the music. Um, I was on the fence about how I felt about this piece until I heard the music. And then it just completely came alive for me. Um, you can, you can hear the music, you can see the movement, I can, it transports me to being in a jazz club. Um, and this is part of a, a six uh, piece series um, that Bearden did in 1979, the greatest year that ever was, <laughs> the year that I was born. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's actually an edition of 175 of these. I was looking you know, up information specifically about the series and you can buy them. So my birthday is coming up, just saying, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah, th there's there's different editions that are actually being auctioned off as we speak right now, which is really cool. Um, and these are just, uh, you know, it looks like initially, you know, I thought it was maybe watercolor or something, but it's a lithograph printed on arches. Um, and yeah, Luke Curisa, did you want to add anything? <laughs> Well, I, I just, I absolutely love this piece. I mean, number one, you know, we know that Bearden was um, highly influenced by music and by jazz and blues in particular. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, he wrote songs for Billie Holiday and for Dizzy Gillespie. And uh, later on, he designed a, a record cover for Wynton Marsalis. And so he himself felt like, um, you know, his work reflected elements of jazz um, uh, and in particular improvisation. And so, you know, when I look at this piece, I see that exactly. And um, just the name of the piece, Tenor Sermon, really evoked a lot in me. And it made me first and foremost because he um, uh, was from the South. And so it kind of made me think about, you know, those old Southern um, Baptist preachers and their sermons and, and how there was always the kind of call and response. And so when I look at this piece and I see, you know, the center um, horn player, it just kind of made me think about, you know, the, the Baptist preacher sitting in the center and, and doing his thing. And then he would have his associates that were behind him, you know, kind of like encouraging him and egging him on. Yeah, say that, Pastor. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so I just kind of... <laughs> I know. I, I felt this whole thing when I'm I'm looking at this and and look and, and thinking about you know what he called it. And so I could literally, you know, feel also that movement when you're when you're in a jazz club and you have someone that's doing that solo, and then you have, you know, the the other players that are kind of interjecting sound here and there, which 
to me was like, say that preacher, yeah. You, you know? <laughs> so it kind of all um, brought that together. And then also, you know, um, knowing that when he was a child, his, his family home was right across the street from the stage door of the Lafayette. Lafayette. And um, for many years, his studio was above the Apollo Theater. And with all of that going on, people would come to his home and his family home, Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, um, Ella Fitzgerald, they were all there. And so, of course, he's, he's being influenced by all of that being around. And so I just, I, I, I just think this is, a, it's a great piece. And it, it I, I got excited and I get excited when I see this because it just brings to me all of that, that feeling and that color. So it looks like someone's looking at some of these auctions uh, maybe to buy that piece for you, Dimitri. But we, but we need to know, have you My been- My birthday is in February, you have time. Have you been bumptious, <laughs> she's not gonna buy that piece for you, so. Uh, well, yeah, um, it's, I have to say, I'm not gonna lie, after you guys talked about it is when I'm, I'm really seeing the art, uh, seeing it and also hearing it now. I can't unhear it and hand hear the music from, um, from this art. The next piece, piece is also, oh, I'm excited about the next piece. Okay. I really am. Um, okay. Charlie, this, the music, here we go. So this is uh, the very, very famous John Coltrane piece called Naima, which was named after his wife. Uh, and Coltrane is playing with Duke Ellington here. Again, uh, Ellington would, would pair up with a lot of really, really great musicians in his lifetime. But, uh, you know, this is a fascinating piece. First of all, you know, when we were playing this piece amongst ourselves, all of us were saying, oh, that's my favorite jazz piece. You know, I mean, it, it certainly would in, be in my top five. And it's just, you know, you listen to that first role of the saxophone and you know you're just in in another place it's such an ethereal piece and it's really interesting because you know as a result of his life and i'm not talking about alice coltrane who, who later led him in, into sort of an indian philosophy but uh, as a result of his wife naima that was her, her middle name he had a, a certain religious awakening as a result of his connection with her and it, it sort of helped him kick his heroin habit and he really was grateful to her for that. And, you know, boy, what, what better thank you present could you give to someone than, than, a, than a piece like that? All right, well, Dimitri, Bukarisa, go for it. Um, well, Sorry. today, actually, because I, I don't know if Lou Carissa knows knows that we have this, but if you could just uh, show the, the other slide, do you mind? Of course not. This one. Woo! All right. Yeah, I'm so good. I didn't know you had this, but I was so glad because when I saw this, I flipped out. Go ahead, Dimitri. Right? So, so, so did I. So did I. So, okay. Well, we can talk about it simultaneously. But um, yeah, so, so, so Bearden has um, this whole series where he was looking at um, traditional Western uh, iconography. Um, and he was actually making uh, paint, he was making photocopies in 1977. And he starkly realized that there was really no black characters um, in the artwork. And so he decided to reverse the, the black and white color scheme um, to inject African um, identity into these, into these works. Um, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna give too much away, but one of the things I, I hope we can kind of zoom, go back and zoom, but I mean, I wanted to show them side by side because you could see um, where his influence came for the, uh, the arrangement, the composition. Um, you know, I didn't notice this initially, but that there's Ulysses in where we're focusing in the back right corner coming in the door and that's his ship just 
just uh, docking right outside as these suitors are coming to try to make their claim on Penelope. Well, anyway, Ulysses goes on in the story to uh, to defeat them. <laughs> um, and there's there's a there's a bow and a quiver, bow arrow and quiver um, hanging on the wall behind her. Um, and Luquiti said, "I don't want to just get. I don't want to take the, this whole thing because I really could." I could really oh. just go off, <laughs> no. um, but but what, yeah. but yeah, one of the one of the things that I love about this is that it's a screen print. Now, if anyone's done screen print, you know that each color has to have a separate screen, um, and you know. So he worked with this amazing Brandywine graphic workshop. I love screen printing, by the way, um, and it's I'm just amazed at how all these details could be put in, you know, in here, like it's it's just masterful is all that I, I've got to say. If anyone has tried screen printing, um, you know, it's not just getting the registration, but like knowing how the colors interact with each other, um, that this is just masterfully done. But Lou Kudisa, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, really, you kind of covered it all. I mean, I like I said, I was completely blown away when I was when I was doing um, my homework and I pulled up that other, I was like, oh my goodness. And so um, obviously it's it's patterned, um, well, it's it's about the the Odyssey, um, the ancient Greek epic. And um, the story was after a 10 year quest to return home following the Trojan War, Odysseus, Odysseus yeah, <laughs> arrives uh, to find his wife Penelope under siege by suitors. And so she had promised to marry one of them after she finished her weaving. So we can see her sitting there at the loom. And, but she was convinced that her husband was gonna return. And so she, as she wove during the day at night, she would take it all apart so that she would never be finished with this whole thing, right? And so she would never have to, to marry any of the suitors. And so once um, her husband returns back and he sees how faithful she, she's been, he fights off the suitors, he reclaims his place as king. And so as, as we look at this and, and we saw the other earlier, there's there's some marked differences, you know, in, in what he did in the fact that like the original, um, thank you, the original, when you look at the, the square tiled floor, it gives you kind of that in-depth feeling. However, with uh, Romir's piece, it's more of a flat look, you know, then you see the cat that's playing with the, the ball of yarn in the foreground. And it's been said that Bearden used his, substituted his own cat when he was doing this place. This, this piece. And so then with the, the window, you see the boat that's floating by and you see um, in, in the original where it's kind of um, stationary kind of there. And then you see all of the, the suitors um, on the right at the door behind them. And of course, you know, as, as Dimitri was saying earlier, you know, the whole thing was flipped in terms of um, the race because in the original, everyone obviously is your of European descent, whereas in <laughs> whereas in Rom, uh, Romero's piece, you know, they're all of African descent, and so you see all of this, and I, it just I I'm so excited about this. I have so much to say. Right. <laughs> Oh my God. But he literally, he took this, this, um, this original piece, which is by, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time with this name, but I think it's Pin, uh, Pinterichio, Pinterichio, I believe it is. It. Um, he took his whole piece and just, and he flipped it. And he, he interjected his own ideas about space, about composition, about color into this piece. I, I love this. I um when I I have to admit when I first saw this piece I thought eh, you know it's not one of my favorites of Ramir and Ramir is is like one of my favorites favorite artists but this piece I was kind of like uh eh, you know it's okay <laughs> and then and then when I saw what it was really about and and how he took it and flipped I was just, I flipped out I just completely flipped out this is great absolutely yeah and, and you know i i think also you like um luke Corisa, what you were saying i didn't i didn't have knowledge of african-american artists who were who were kind of you know going to the classic canon and, re and reversing it you know i'm i'm thinking someone like hehende wiley who is super contemporary right, you know right. who does something similar or ginka shonebari but 
I mean, th he was doing this in the 70s. And, you know, mm. just it, it's almost like he was paving the way for all of these artists that we idolize now um, by just looking towards this and injecting this African identity yes. into the work. And, and, and for me, that was where I just like, not just the technical aspect of like, how did you create this this screen print right, <laughs> that I want to know, right. um, you know, how many people were in the workshop because he had to have a crew who was, yes. you know, who were, who were making sure everything lined up perfectly. And, you know, just, just thinking about even the flow of the ink. So yeah, I will nerd out about the technical aspects of that, but just taking this whole thing and re envisioning, recreating this history that is based off of a mythology. Um, right. So why not, you know, change it around? And the fact that I mean, he even yeah. got into to so much as as doing doing the hair wraps, you know, you know head wraps, yeah, the head wraps, right? And I'm, I, yeah. that she has on and her servant has on, and I'm just like, I mean, he really got down to the nitty gritty when he decided to do a reversal on this this piece. He, he got down to it. Yeah, I mean, that's so true. And I, I want to check with Remy to see if the diasporic lean has been. <laughs> yeah. Implemented. It's, it's, to it's totally there. You see, the, you see Ulysses at the front with that knee bent. You know, he needs. A, it's about to go into some, some, some situation there. But also, I, I wanted to say is just the color palette is it, in terms of our skin tone, and yes. uh, that he's chosen to do that, that use colors that again really complement our skin tone where you see Karen and friends on the left um, wearing this sort of duller type, you know, the darker greens, but he still uses the green, but he bumps it and boosts it, which again, I think is his way of saying, you know, we have our own pantheon of uh, within our own culture as well. So, yeah. I, I just uh, have... Did we, did we mention that the, uh, the person here, I think that's <laughs> supposed to be some saint. Um, I don't know, but the oh. kind of the omission, the dotted person. Yeah. Yeah. I also have to thank uh, Pamela and Candace for keeping me honest here. I misspoke. <laughs> it's not Naima that we were playing. It's in a sentimental mood, which is also one of my top five jazz songs <laughs> of all time. But thank you. You're absolutely right. Uh, I misspoke. Charlie, you did that on purpose to see if people were ten paying attention, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just want to say to Pamela and friends, thank you for keeping Charlie in check. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't. <laughs> oh. It's so oh, funny. Man. And, oh. and Remy, I, we have this next piece. Um, and so the music with this one again i think it's it's so fitting let's see drop me off in harlem any old place in harlem there's someone waiting there who'll make it seem like heaven up in harlem you can have your dixie cause i don't want your dixie there's no one down in Dixie who can keep me away from my heart, Harlem. Harlem. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's Adelaide Hall. And, you know, again, a, a perfect song to use talking about the, the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, and she's such a fascinating character as well. So she's in the Guinness Book of World Records because she has recorded over eight consecutive decades. So she, she holds the record for longevity of a recorded career. But, you know, she, she also, I, you know, I talked about that, that show that Blake and Sissel did called Shuffle Along and how important that was. She was in the chorus line of that show. Uh, just, a, just a really interesting character. She had a really good career here and then uh, married a British guy and ended up doing a lot of her work in Europe. And in fact, um, you know, she would do things like she, she she sang in a bomb shelter while London was being bombed. And she said that she she drank, she drank, she sang 54 encores in a row, which is, you know, an apparent record for how many art encores would be, you know, sing. And, you know, she 
sang all these songs during the air raids and tried to comfort people in hospitals. And so she did just a lot of great, great work as well as, you know, having this remarkable career and became one of England's most highest paid entertainers at the time. So that's Adelaide Hall. Very important thing in the Harlem Renaissance. Wow. Thank you, Charlie. And Remy, you want to uh, talk about the piece a little bit? And yeah, I I, yeah. I I think the the main thing I really really appreciate about this piece. I think we've we've talked about um, Sergeant Johnson before on previous shows, um, but the thing that I really wanted to focus in while we're looking at this piece in terms of just the way he uses texture and shape. Um, you know, we're looking at this black and white, we see the piano keys, we, see, you know, I, I, and I also see, you know, aspects of, of Harlem, we're looking at the jazz and the nightclubs, we're looking at, for me, I see the, the face of the woman, partly I see this eye, and almost looks like somebody going out at night with makeup on, but then you see, um, I see the I don't know, the chimney stack with smoke coming out at the top as well. Um, and I, you know, I also see the top of the head where it looks more like the brain and the textures there mm. as well. Um, yeah, just just the, the actual, you know, the, the, it, when you look at it as a whole piece, it looks very simple. But then as you start to zero in to all of the different sections, you start to see how he's using shadow and and light and and value in the piece as well. So I just think it's so yeah. incredibly beautiful. And you know, it's undoubtedly a black woman, right? It's an undoubtedly mm -hmm. a black woman. And I would like to read a, a, a quote from him that he gave to San Francisco uh, Chronicle in, in 1971. And, um, you know, he's he arrived in San Francisco right before the exposition, the big exposition here. And he was really impressed, stayed here, got married that same year. So we have a lot of history back in the Bay Area with Sergeant Johnson. <laughs> Sergeant Johnson. But I do want to read this quote from him. It is a pure Amer It is the pure American Negro I'm concerned with aiming to show the natural beauty and dignity in that characteristic lip and that characteristic hair bearing and manner. And I wish to show, to show that beauty, not so much to the white man as the Negro himself. And so that's a quote that he had. And um, it's, with, with his sculpture, it's, it's right away, um, you know, I can see it and I can, I can see that, that, uh, that dedication, that, that kind of that um, intention. And with this one, not immediately, but then I look at her and I'm like, this is definitely a black woman. And, you know, looking at Lenox Avenue, from the map that we just looked at um, in the beginning, um, I'm looking at the line that he made, uh, you know, just looking at the map of that, you know, the kind of like, kind of the, the, the life of the Harlem, Harlem right there. Lenox is right here, you can see it right here. And it just makes me feel like he's tracing the road itself or the street itself, Lenox Avenue itself. Um, so yeah, this piece is kind of special and I, I really like it. And if folks are interested in this map, it is uh, with the Library of Congress and I put the link in the chat. It is, it is in public domain and it's such a beautiful map that you can check out yourself. Um, yeah. And I, and I was, I was going to say, it, it says, uh, uh, a nightclub map and it just to me just represents of how many nightclubs that that there were around and how you know all of those nightclubs were, were laying the foundations of all of this black music that we now take for granted every day that is yeah. you know that, that underpins our daily lives as well so mm. yeah yeah I, I just I, I just want to add in my dad's from New York and so I, I went there and gr I grew up going there a lot you know and I think also just Lenox Avenue which is now Malcolm X is in Malcolm X Boulevard now um is Malcolm X um but anyway it you know it just was it's just even as a kid you know going to visit going to visit there obviously I wasn't around during the Harlem Renaissance but it, it was just key to connecting so many ethnic neighborhoods 
um, you know, so bringing together Spanish and, um, you know, uh, Caribbean folks, or I think they call them West Indians over in New York, um, and <laughs> African Americans, Puerto um, Ricans, you know, Puerto Ricans, just bringing everybody together um, through this, this um, avenue that has so much life to it. So I just want to add that too. So I, th I think you're absolutely right that the line is representing the avenue. Does anyone know about the pencil test? What does that mean? I don't know about that. I, I, I didn't know, but um, I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. My apologies for that. Um, you, uh, you asked the pencil test. Could you, could you put in the chat what that, that means? I have. Oh, no I know. I know what you mean. Oh, it's, it's, oh. it's the, the chip, if you what put I was, the pencil and it sticks. In your hair. Yes. But are you oh. are you also saying that the thing that I was calling a chimney stack at the back could be a pencil as well? Is that mm. is that because I can see that too that 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 image yeah. at the back could be a pencil with the yeah I was calling it a chimney stack with a little smoke coming out of the back. Mm. Yes, well, that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Projection. We have three pieces. Yes, we have three pieces and about 10 minutes left before, uh, before we finish. And I want to move on to this next piece, which is another beautiful drawing. Um, tell us. Yeah, so that's James P. Johnson, who was uh, really important at the time. I don't think he's well known as well known as some of the other artists that we've talked about. But he was sort of a pioneer of what's called the stride piano. And stride piano is this, is this way where the left hand of the piano takes a much more important role than usual. So you, what you would do with your right hand, you would just tap out the, the melody. But then in, with the left hand, you would not only do the bass line, which was you know, the common thing to do, but you would also move up and, and play some of the sort of in-between notes. Uh, so that was known as a stride piano. And he was, he's considered the, the transition between ragtime and jazz because of that movement into, into stride piano. And he was such an important pianist and such an important influence to other pianists. So, you know, he, he, he influenced Jolly Roll Morton, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Art Tatum, of course, was a giant of, of jazz. And Fats Waller was actually his student. And he was a composer as well. So the, that song that many of us know, which, you know, if you had to pick one song to really think about the 20s, Charleston, Charleston, da 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 da, da Charleston, that's his song. So really- Keep going, Charlie. I'm sorry? I said, keep going, Charlie. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just, uh, you know, just uh, but I, I love, I, I have to just give the title of two of his songs, which I think are so great. So one of his songs was, if I could be with you one hour tonight. Yeah, I thought that was a great one. And then he has another one called A Porter's Love Song to a Chambermaid, which I thought was just a really sweet title. So, and just as a side note, we just talked about Ramar Bearden. Two of his paintings have names of his compositions. Uh, one's called Carolina Shout, the other one's called Snowy Morning. So uh, again, I love it when these influences are, are crossing over each other and, and showing the importance to each other. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I can, I, again, just going back to this one, you know, what I absolutely love about this work is that we're seeing the artist's handwriting, the artist writing her address, Lomi Melu Jones is writing her address of her studio in Washington, DC. You can see it at the bottom. And she's requesting the print to be set there. And I think some sort of edit to the printer um, with the pr printing uh, folks. And she, this is a pen drawing. She drew this uh, by pen. And when we zoom in it, you can kind of see the, the markings or the texture that the pen has, has um, 
um, has left the darkness in the the lightness of it as well you can see that and this is uh this is kind of the greeting letter that she prepares um and you know this is very different from what i have seen from her work uh, which is extremely afrocentric work is what she what i've i've known her for uh, but she's such a versatile um, artist i mean she's an educator she's a coach she has done it all she has done pretty much everything and i can see that happening in her art also she she can paint she can she can draw and at the same time also uh, connect different aspects of her life and an identity um, in the work and I, I think she you know um there's something really light and, and nice about about this uh, this piece as well I, I really enjoy it the next piece is also by her and let's listen to the music Tell us about this music. And I, 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 we didn't include the words uh, because we can only do about 30 seconds, but the words, whew. Oh yeah, the words are, are very powerful. Mm -hmm. That's St. James Infirmary, if any of you know that that song. And if you don't know the song, you might want to just look up the lyrics because- uh, Yeah, but you know, Charlie, well, they attended, um, the, for all, everyone that has attended, we'll send you the link to the full um, listening so you can listen to it on your own time, yeah. Yeah, and I think you get the feel of the lyrics when you, uh, you know, when you hear that song. It's just, it's a very, very sad song. But Louis Armstrong, you know, he, he was amazing. So one thing I'm sure most of you didn't know about Louis Armstrong, was that he spoke Yiddish fluently. <laughs> it was oh. amazing. You know, his, his dad had left him and he was, his, his mother was taken in by this um, Lithuanian Jewish family. And so, you know, the, the mother of that family used to sing him lullabies uh, in, in Russian and Yiddish. And, and he learned to speak perfect Yiddish, which I would love to have heard that. But, you know, it's really interesting because I think, you know, a lot of us who know his later work um, maybe a lot of you don't know his work, but when I was a kid, you know, Hello Dolly was a huge hit. In, in fact, it was such a huge hit that it displaced the Beatles from being the number one record for many, many, many weeks. But, you know, I, I think that as him being sort of this entertainer, but what I think a lot of us don't know is that he was a remarkable trumpet player. Um, and he used to do these uh, kind of like contests among other trumpet players. And, you know, he used to brag that he could play 200 high C's on his trumpet in a row. And, you know, I, I played trumpet as a kid and uh, I'd be happy if I could get one, uh, you know, but, you know, he just was a really remarkable uh, player, but he also was a remarkable band leader. Like one of the things they said about him is that he was incredibly generous towards his other musicians and that he, he tended to make other musicians feel comfortable so that they would play their best. And he always wanted to make sure that they all shared the spotlight in the music. So. Yeah, he, was a, he became somewhat of a controversial figure. Um, he felt like he, he, he wanted to be apolitical and he took a lot of grief about that. But then he ended up um, sort of putting the, you know, Eisenhower's feet to the fire because Eisenhower didn't really stand up for what was going on in, in Little, Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas. And he ended up being, you know, sort of, he ended up having a file opened by the FBI upon him. And so, you know, in the end, he, he did become a, a political figure, whether, whether he wanted to or not. But, you know, just a, a fascinating guy, brilliant musician. Thanks, Charlie. Whew. Wow. Dimitri and Lucarisa, tell us about the art. Um, I'll just keep it really fast. I, I think, again, you know, we, we saw that very controlled, you know, um, pen and ink drawing 
you know, in the in the previous one, and here it's it's a little just you you see her freeform um, mastery, and I just just the mood that she captures in every single line, um, you know, that she puts down. This woman was just a genius with her seven. Um, you know, her seven decade career, and I'm waiting for someone to do a Lois Mayu Jones, um, you know, retrospective somewhere. I haven't seen one in my lifetime, but, you know, she's just so amazing. I think, you know, in every history book, there's um, her piece, um, La Fetiche, the, with the, the African masks that she did mm. that made her so famous. Um, but like you said today, she is, um, you know, so versatile. She started off as a textile designer. And then so, and I don't know, we have some um, works by her that we'll see, I guess, in the next round. In part two, um, yes. In part two, that <laughs> yeah. are that are based on her, her textile. But then she decided to become a fine artist and mastered everything, literally everything. Um, so yeah, Luca Risa, do you want to add anything? <laughs> Well, her her style definitely shifted and evolved multiple times, and it, you know it happened because of the different influences in her life. She traveled extensively through Europe and Africa and the Caribbean, and so you know that obviously influenced you know her how she how she painted, and she worked with different mediums, different techniques, and you know of course her her career was extensive. I mean, her first um, solo show was when she was eighteen. And she painted up until she was like 94. So <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Um, when I look at this piece, this piece is just so, I don't know, it's so somber uh, to me. I, I spent a lot of time just really looking at it and there was something slightly familiar to me about it that I couldn't at first pinpoint. And then I realized that it reminded me of when I was on a trip to the Dominican Republic and there were scenes like this where you had African-American men working outside in the blazing sun, you know, hauling sex of whatever the job of the day um, required. And I was, as I, as I realized that, I was really happy and gratified in the fact that she used a very stark approach to this. And I love the fact that she didn't include trees or grass or foliage or color, which would have lulled, lulled us into that false notion that because of all that beauty, that the work wasn't backbreaking, because this work is backbreaking work. And you can see it, you know, in, in these figures as they're carrying things, as they're, you know, as they have things in their, their hands to till the ground. And so it's, it's just a very somber piece. And just really makes me, you know, remember um, just how back backbreaking work they do in, in those areas. So, yeah. I think I, I love, I love just, the line connects. Go ahead, Remy. Sorry, I was just going to add. I think yeah, again, ahead. it's a another great example in terms of art where less is more. As you mm. were saying, Lucretia, it's almost like what you don't see tells the story. It's like you can feel the heat on their bodies but you don't see the sun, you know, and that's an experience we all have sometimes that we feel it, but we, you know, we feel the heat in our bodies and just the digging and the pant leg that's up, you know, the, the, the diasporic lean with the hand on the hip, it's like, I'm exhausted with this shit, excuse me. Yeah. And, you know, yes. I mean, yes. just the, the, the brilliance of, of choosing, you know, the, the, the composition where you have the few people and then the two people and, you know, the spade in the ground as well. You could feel the ground is hard, but she does nothing to show you what the texture of the ground is, you know? And so we get to see these other elements of weather and texture, but, there's, but it's all what we work to put there as well. So she really builds this relationship between us, the audience and her, the artist. I think it's, I think she is genius. She sure is. Yes, Remy. Absolutely. Also, for keeping it real and using grown folks language. <laughs> and then, okay, so the last piece, and I, um, this is such a beautiful piece. Again, the same artist, and um, the same artist, and let's listen to the music. I'm gonna sit right down and write myself a letter and make believe it came from you I'm gonna write words oh so sweet they're gonna knock me off my 
All right. Well, that's that's Waller, who uh, they think copyrighted over 400 songs, but really they think he wrote many, many songs, many more songs than that, because whenever he had you know, money troubles, he would sell the rights to, to his songs uh, and other people would, would claim it as as it own as their own. But, you know, he's just a really important member of the, the Harlem Renaissance. And I, I love this quote about him that, that he was the most relaxed man I ever saw in a studio. And so he made everybody else relax. And so again, just, just like with Louis Armstrong, it, it, what it would do is it would really have these musicians bring out the best in themselves, you know, because they didn't feel like, uh, you know, he was being pressuring them or, or something like that. But there's just a great story that I have to tell about him because I think it's so, so funny. He's sitting there playing and he, he finishes his gig and he's, he's about to, to leave. And this is in Chicago, okay? So this is important, Chicago in 1927. And all of a sudden he's leaving this gig and four men grab him they bundle him up and throw him into a car they've got guns he can see the guns he, he gets taken to this place he doesn't even know what this place is and then he's you know he's with a gun to his back he's pushed towards a piano and he's told to play and what it ends up is that he was going to be the surprise guest at Al Capone's birthday party and then, you know they had no intention of killing him but you know, they couldn't be, I guess they thought they couldn't convince him otherwise unless they threw him in a car so I just love that that story about him but um yeah that's uh that's Fats Wall. oh wow yeah, and then this piece, I, I think it's, it makes for the, the best last piece for us to talk about also is watercolor. And those of you who have worked with watercolor, um, you know how unpredictable, uncontrollable. Remy, tell me, tell me. I, I, I want to hear it from <laughs> Remy. I'm not a big fan of watercolor, but I want to hear it from Remy. You know, I so don't know how to use watercolor that I have to use the watercolor crowns so that I can have some <laughs> control over my medium. <laughs> you know, like I'm in I'm in the pre-K class when it comes to watercolor and trying to manipulate. I, you know, I it's, just think this is just so brilliant as a medium. Yeah, it, I mean, exactly. This, I think this. I think when you look at her work and all her styles of work. I think this is really what classes somebody who is really a master of their craft. And I think we, you know, that word gets thrown around, you know, in, in, in the Karen Institute for a lot of people. Uh, but I think it really is something that we really should give to those that really deserve it. And she is somebody who really is, has mastered her arts not just one but her arts so yes flowers to my sister and that's all I can say yes I agree and, and just you know I am gonna say you know we're gonna send you the link to to look at this art I think it's one that you want to spend time with and look at each texture that she has created um the white shirt is not white if you look at it it's made out of blue and brown and and um all these other colors so it's it's a study of watercolor it's an it, it's an expression of expertise in watercolor it's a, it's so many great things so I yeah you'll see the link um Thank you so much for joining us today. And I would like to especially thank Charlie for put, putting this music and art of Harlem together. We invite you again for part two on the 12th of October. Lucarisa, Remy, Dimitri, and Ronnie, who's, who's, who's left us at the in the middle. Thank you so, so much. I, I am just so grateful and I, I love all of you, you know that. And I hope to see all of you again uh, again, if you'd like to support us, you can text that number and then make your donation. Um, and um, we also in, you know, encourage you to become members as well. Um, and thank you, everyone. See you, see you soon. And see visit, you us, when, weeks. No, visit us when we open as well. That's right. In a month's time. In a month's time. Right, Dimitri? Yes. Dimitri, Dimitri is not, uh, nodding. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye everyone. Thanks.